Hi, welcome to the um, chapter one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The chapter eleven reading of Just Mercy. Um, I'm going to try something different today, which is taking notes on my computer um, so that you can see them. So let's get started. Get this done as quick as we can, so we can move on with, you know, whatever we do when we're not doing schoolwork. Um, so this is just Murray, so it's 10th grade. My 10th grade classes are first period, fourth period, and fifth period. Go to your Google Classroom. Let's do fifth period today just for the fun of it. Um, and click on classwork. Come down to just mercy. All right, let's do it. And then like I always do, pop it out in a new tab so that that never happens to me. Um, chapter 10, 11, chapter 11, because we already did chapter 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Okay, 11, I'll fly away. All right, that's on page 178. So let's get there first. Why am I going slow? Um, nope, there it was. Okay. Oops, someone is emailing me. I hope you couldn't see that. I don't know what it said. Okay. Let's make this. And remember, I just click and drag it. It's going to bring that over here and then I'm gonna get that to a size I like right now but I'll probably make it bigger first let's open up where we're gonna take the notes online so I'm just gonna open it up into a Google Doc any old plain Google Doc so you can go to docs.google.com type that in this screen will come up open up a blank document and I am going to title it Dumb. Just Mercy, Chapter 11. <laughs> and Chapter 11 is called, I'm pretty sure I'll fly away. Okay. Notes, Chapter 11. I'll fly away. Okay. So I'm going to pull this tab out. And I'm going to bring it over here. Let's see if I can get this how I want it. There we go. So, we will have some, oops, something like, I think that's good. Open this up. How big do I want this? Yeah, this is making me happy. Um, Okay. Okay. And then I just, okay, let's do it. I also am a bullet point kind of person. So let's get our bullet points on. Okay. We can make this a little bigger. It's behind me. Cool, cool, cool. All right. <clears throat> So I'm ready. I've got my book open. I've got my notes open. I got my beautiful face. Okay. Let's make this bigger. Okay. Got my baby baby. There we go. Chapter 11, I'll fly away from pages 178 to 198. It's like 20 pages we're reading. It was the third bomb threat in two months. Okay, yes. If we remember... The last chapter ended, oh, the last chapter was uh, mitigation. It was the young man, I, I believe his name was Avery, yeah, who um, Stevenson represented and got off death row, um, and who had been mentally disabled in various ways. Um, but the chapter before that had ended with uh, them getting bomb threats for the work he was doing with Walter McMillan because he had started looking into the Vicki Pittman murder, which wasn't even the murder 
Walter was accused of. So we're back to the Walter case. That was just me figuring out where we were. It's something a good reader does. Like, oh, wait, I haven't read in a couple days. Where am I? So that's where we are. Um, looking into Vicki Pittman, working on Walter's case, getting bomb threats. Cool, cool. I'll fly away. It was the third bomb threat in two months. As we quickly, quickly cleared the office and waited for the police to arrive, the entire EJI staff, five attorneys and investigator, law school interns, and three administrative staff members were nervous. None of them had signed on for bomb threats. It was tempting to ignore them, but two years earlier, an African-American civil rights lawyer in Savannah, Georgia, named Robert Robbie Robinson was murdered when a bomb sent to his law office exploded. Around the same time, federal appeals court judge Robert Vance was killed in Birmingham by a mail bomb. Days later, a third bomb was sent to a civil rights office in Florida and a fourth to a courthouse in Atlanta. The bomber seemed to be attacking legal professionals connected to civil rights. We were warned that we could be targets, and for weeks we carefully hauled our mail packages to the federal courthouse for x-ray screenings before opening them. After that, bomb threats were no good joke. So, EJI getting bomb threats. Okay. Everyone fled the building while we discussed the likelihood of an act actual bombing. The caller had described our building precisely when making the threat. Sharon, our receptionist, said the man sounded middle-aged and southern, but she couldn't give any more description. It wasn't his first time calling. I'm doing you a favor, he said threateningly. I want y'all to stop doing what you're doing. My first option is, to, is, my first option is not to kill everybody, so you better get out of there now. Next time there won't be a warning. Although I was handling other cases, I was certain the calls were in response to the McMillan case. Michael and I had been followed several times while doing investigative work in Monroe County. I got threatening calls at home. One typical caller said, If you think we're going to let you help that lowlife get away with killing that girl, you've got another thing coming. You're both going to be dead. It was hard to know how seriously to take any of it, but it was definitely unnerving. So I'm typing over here also, death threats and threat, I mean, phone calls. Oops, I know, I know I don't have to fix it, but I'm gonna have to fix it. After clearing the building, the police went through the office with dogs. No bomb was found, and when the building didn't blow up after an hour and a half, we all filed back inside. We had work to do. A few days later, a call came from the clerk's office in Baldwin County. The clerk was calling to let the clerk was calling to let me know that Judge Norton had ruled in the McMillan case. She needed my fax number to send me a copy of the filing. So this, if I remember correctly, is the Rule 32 motion that let them go back into court and present new evidence. I'm guessing the last sentence said we waited. I waited nervously by the fax machine. When only three sheets of paper came through the machine, I was concerned. The pages contained a tersely worded order from Judge Norton denying us relief. So denying means no relief. They're not getting what they want. After all that, Walter's death penalty conviction remained. So I'm going to say Rule 32... Results, no relief, Ooh, re relief, no change for Walter. Okay. For all his interest at the hearing, he had never seemed particularly interested in the basic question of whether Walter was guilty or innocent. Oh, he said, I had expected this would be Judge Norton's response. For all his interest at the hearing, he had never seemed particularly interested in the basic question of whether Walter was guilty or innocent. What was surprising, however, was how superficial and thoughtless the court's two-and-a-half-page order read. 
The judge addressed only Ralph Meyer's testimony and none of the many legal claims we presented or any of the testimonies of the other dozen plus witnesses. I was disappointed, but not hopeless. There was a next step. We could bring our evidence to the Alabama Criminal Court of Appeals. Next step, Alabama Criminal Court of Appeals. We were now regularly arguing cases in front of that court and they were starting to respond to our advocacy. We had, fun, we had won four reversals in death penalty cases in 1990, four more in 91, and by the end of 92, we'd won relief for another eight death row prisoners. Though the court was often resisted, we persisted and continued raising serious errors in capital cases. I was optimistic that we could win relief for Mr. McMillan on appeal. Even if the court was unwilling to rule that Walter was innocent and should be released, the withholding of exculpatory evidence, and here he describes what exculpatory evidence is, the withholding of evidence in Walter's favor. So the other side not giving up the evidence that kind of showed Walter was innocent. The withholding of exculpatory evidence, evidence in his favor, was extreme enough that the case would likely require a new trial. I explained to Walter that with the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals, we were only just now getting to a court where our claims would be seriously considered. The, um, or, I'm going to actually go back up. Really? No. What do I want to say? The first court Stevenson Act will think will actually consider. I'm just going to write justice because what Walter doesn't have at the moment is justice. All right. At this time, Michael had been hired as a San Diego federal public defender. He agonized about leaving EJI, but he was ready to leave Alabama. One of our new attorneys, Bernard Halcourt, replaced him on Walter's case. Bernard Harcourt replaces um, Michael. Then he leaves for SD. Bernard was a lot like Michael in that he was smart, determined, and extremely hardworking. He had been preparing for a traditional legal career until he came down to work with us one summer and became fascinated by the issues that the death penalty cases presented. He quickly immersed himself in Walter's case. The crowd at Walter's hearing got the community talking about what we had presented in court. More people started coming forward with helpful information and claims of police corruption and misconduct. Bernard and I continued to track leads and interview people in Monroe County. Not everyone was swayed by the hearing, though. Local Monroeville and Mobile newspapers printed claims that Walter was a drug kingpin, a sexual predator, and a gang leader. Despite all the evidence presented at our hearing showing that Walter had nothing to do with the Pittman murder, the local press used it to scare up more fear about him. The narrative in the press was clear. This man was extremely dangerous. The threats we'd received made me worry about the hostility that Walter would face if he was ever released. I wondered how safely he could live locally, if everyone outside his community was persuaded that he was a dangerous murderer. The case was now pending in the Court of Criminal Appeals. If the public could only know what we knew, it might ease his re-entry into freedom. We wanted people to understand this simple fact. Walter did not commit the murder. Uh, Stevenson worried what will happen to Walter if he is released. Um. Alright, could some positive media attention help our case? I wasn't so sure. In fact, the chief judge on the court, John Patterson, had famously sued the New York Times 
over their coverage of the civil, right move, civil rights movement, the civil rights movement when he was Alabama's governor. And that is the chief judge on this um, court. Okay. It was a common to okay, the chief judge on the court had sued the New York Times over their coverage of the civil rights movement back when he was the governor. Okay, it was a common, ta common tactic used by Southern politicians during civil rights protests. Accused newspapers of trying to ruin their reputations, even sue them for defamation if they provided sympathetic coverage of civil rights activists or if they critiqued Southern politicians and law enforcement officers. I had no doubt that national press coverage of Walter's case would not help our cause in the Criminal Court of Appeals. My general attitude was that press coverage rarely helped our clients. Beyond the general anti-media sentiments in the South, the death penalty was a politically charged topic. Even sympathetic pieces about people on death row usually triggered a backlash that created more problems for the client. And the case. But I did think getting a more informed view of Walter's conviction and the murder would convince some locals that he was innocent. And assuming we could ever get his conviction overturned, make his life easier after release. Wait, make his life after release less dangerous. Making up words. It was risky, but we felt we had to take our chances and get the story out. Journalist Pete Early. Jorn. A list. Pete. Early jumped onto the case. Ursley. Not Cobra. Early. Okay. Spent time with several of the involved individuals and quickly came to share our astonishment that Walter had been convicted on such unreliable evidence. That year, I'd given a speech at Yale Law School that was attended by a producer from the popular CBS investigative program, 60 Minutes and he also called me. We filed our appeal in the Court of Criminal Appeals that summer, and with no small amount of lingering uncertainty, I, did, I decided to move forward with the 60 Minutes piece. Um, I guess I... Uh, it doesn't say what Peter Early did. I'm not gonna leave the name there. Maybe we'll come back to it. Um, does... Who does? Brian. Does... 60 minutes interview interview piece uh, with veteran reporter Ed Bradley and his producer David Gelber who came down to New York who came down from New York City to Monroeville on a hundred degree day in July and interviewed many of the people whose testimony we presented at our hearing. They spoke with Walter, Ralph Myers, Karen Kelly, Darnell Houston, Clay Cast, Jimmy Williams, Walter's family, and Woodrow Eichner. They confronted Bill Hooks at his job and interviewed Tommy Chapman extensively. We're going to say interviewed everyone involved in the case. When the 60 Minutes piece aired months later, local law officials and local media outlets were quick to discredit it claiming that it was further injuring Rhonda Morrison's parents. Writers at local newspapers complained that the new publicity could leave many think, many people to think McMillan is innocent. But people in the community watched 60 Minutes all the time and generally trusted it. Despite the local media reaction, the CBS coverage gave the community a summary of the evidence we presented in court and created questions and doubts about Walter's guilt. Um, I like that. Uh, gave the public the information that had been presented in court. Um, people in the black community who had been discussing Walter's wrongful conviction for years were thrilled to see honest coverage of the case. We frequently got calls from people simply seeking an update or a clarification of a particular point that had been the subject of debate in a barbershop or at a social gathering. For many black people in the region, watching the evidence that we had presented in court now laid out on national te television was therapeutic. It turned out that, privately, 
District Attorney Tom Chapman had started worrying about the reliability of the evidence against Walter. Given our success in other death penalty cases, he must have feared that the court might indeed overturn Walter's conviction. Chapman had become the public face defending the conviction, and he realized that he put his own integrity on the line by relying on the work of local investigators, work that was now revealed as almost laughably flawed. Chapman called together Tate, Larry Eichner, and Benson shortly after the hearing to ask them to explain the contradictory evidence we had presented. He wasn't impressed with what he heard. Finally, he decided to ask ABI officials, Alabama Bureau of Investigation officials in Montgomery, to re-examine the evidence and conduct another investigation into the murder to confirm Mr. McMillan's guilt, something we'd been asking him to do for more than two months. Chap, man, just, um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do what he does here. So he does, um, this assumption. And it's okay, it could be true. It could be, like, he says that Chapman realized he put his own integrity on the line. Um, and so maybe that is, that is Stevenson saying that's probably why he did this. He didn't do this out of the goodness of his heart. We're going to leave Stevenson's opinion out. I just want facts in the summary. Um, so we're going to say that the DA, um, after the hearing... Let's do that. Um, after the hearing, DA Chapman, DA's district attorney, and then it says, um, has ABI re-examine and investigate the murder. And this is what I will put in. Two years after, um, uh, EJI, or just Stevenson, Stevenson had been requesting this for two years. See how that's just the facts. I didn't put uh, Chapman's motives in just because, you know, I want the facts. This is a summary. Uh, readers can read the book themselves and decide what they think of Chapman. Chapman never told us directly that he was starting another investigation. We found about it when the new investigators from the ABI, Tom Taylor and Greg Cole, called me. Let's write their names down. Tom, Tom, Taylor, in case they come back up, and Greg Cole are... The new ABI investigators. Um, now that those names probably won't end up in our summary, but they will help me remember who they are when he refers to them later, if he refers to them later. Um, after the meeting with them, I was even more hopeful about what might come out of the investigation. They were not connected to any of the players in southern South Alabama. They both seemed no-nonsense, experienced, and interested in doing honest and reliable work. We gave them all our case files and evidence. We had nothing to hide. I was confident that any reasonable, honest investigation would reveal the absurdity of the charges against Walter. By January, six months had passed since we had filed our appeal at the, criminal, at the Court of Criminal Appeals, and a ruling was due any week. That's when Tom Taylor called and said that he and Cole wanted to meet with us again. We talked a few times during their investigation, but this time we'd finally be discussing their findings. When they arrived, Bernard and I sat down with them in my office and they wasted no time. Okay, um, six months later, I guess, ish. It's a good way to put it. There. <laughs> Taylor and Cole say Mick Millen is not Morrison's killer in meeting with Steven. Okay, so I read that next sentence and wrote that. So he, they say to Brian Stevenson and Bernard, there's no way Walter McMillan killed Rhonda Morrison. 
And so I wrote six months later, Taylor and Cole say Macmillan is not Morrison's killer in a meeting they had with Stevenson. Okay. And they're like, duh. Tom Taylor spoke plainly and directly. We're going to report to the attorney general, the district attorney, and anyone who asks that Macmillan had nothing to do with either of these murders and is completely innocent. I tried not to look as thrilled as I felt. I didn't want to scare away this good news. That's terrific, I said, trying to sound unsurprised. I'm pleased to hear that, and I have to say I'm extremely grateful that you've looked at the evidence in this case thoroughly and honestly. Well, confirming that McMillan had nothing to do with this wasn't that hard, Taylor replied. We were told by local law enforcement about what we were told by local law enforcement about McMillan didn't make much sense. And the stories Myers told and the story I'm trying to read too fast. And the story Myers told at trial definitely made no sense. I still can't believe a jury ever convicted him. Cole spoke up. You'll be very interested to know that both Hooks and Hightower have admitted that their testimony was false. Hooks and Hightower admit their testimony. Hate everything about typing and writing. Testimony uh, was a lie. A lit. Shoot me. Sorry, don't shoot me. I matter to myself. Okay. Really? I couldn't hide my surprise at this. Yes, when we were asked to investigate this case, we were told that you should be invested. We were told that you. Stevenson should be investigated because Hooks had said that you had offered him money and a condo in Mexico if he changed his testimony. Taylor was dead serious. Okay, so um, these Alabama Bureau of Investigations people get the case and they're like, and somebody tells them, hey, you should, uh, you should investigate Brian Stevenson himself because Hooks told us that Brian Stevenson had offered him money and a condo, a free and apartment, if Hooks changed his testimony. A condo in Mexico? On a beach, I think, Cole added nonchalantly. Wait, me? I was going to give Bill Hooks a beach condo in Mexico if he changed his testimony against Walter? It was difficult to contain my shock. Well, I know it must sound crazy to you, but believe me, there were people down there who were raring to get you indicted. But when we talked to Hooks, it didn't take very long before he not only acknowledged that he'd never spoken to you and that you had never bribed him, but he also admitted that his trial testimony against McMillan was completely made up. We never had any doubts that Hooks was lying, I noted. Cole chuckled. We started polygraphing people and things fell apart pretty quick quickly. Polygraphing is lie detector tests. We started polygraphing people and things fell apart pretty quickly. Bernard asked the obvious question. What happens now? Hi. I'm working much better I love you. I'm going to go. I'm going to play outside with the home. Okay. Can I go back to work? Yeah. Kiss my face. Mwah. Love you. Taylor looked over at his partner and then at us. Okay, Bernard said, what happens now? Well, we're not completely done. We'd like to solve this crime. I'm wondering if you might be willing to help us. I know you're not trying to get anybody on death row, but we thought you might consider providing some help to identify the real killer. People would be a lot more accepting of Mr. McMillan's innocence if they know who really committed the crime. So again, Taylor and Cole want to solve the crime. Okay. While it was ridiculous to think that Walter's freedom depended on someone else's arrest, we have long ago concluded that finding the real murderer might be the most effective way to free him. Without law enforcement officers on our side, though, we were limited in what we could uncover. Here's what we have so far. Several witnesses had told us that around the time of the... Okay, let's, let's go um, info... 
they have about the murder. Uh, several witnesses told us that around the time of the crime, they'd seen a white man leaving the clinic. White man left cleaners around the time of the crime. Um, we had learned that before her death, Rhonda Morrison had been receiving menacing calls and that there was a man who had been inappropriately pursuing her. Um, Morrison, for lack of a better word, I probably will not put this word in my summary, but I'm going to write it to myself. Um, Morrison was being stalled. Stalked. Um... We had not been able to identify this. Oh, I didn't read that out loud. We had learned that before her death, Rhonda Morrison had been receiving menacing calls and that there was a man who had been inappropriately pursuing her, stopping by unannounced at the cleaners, maybe even stalking her. We had not been able to identify this strange man. But we did have our suspicions. A white man who seemed intensely interested in the case contacted us frequently to ask about the investigation. He would hint at having information that could help and repeatedly told us he would help prove that Walter McMillan was innocent. He even claimed to know where the murder weapon, which had never been recovered, might be located. We researched the caller's background and discovered a history of stalking, violence against women, and preoccupation with the Morrison murder. We began to think that our caller could be the person who had murdered Rhonda Morrison. We had dozens of phone conversations with him and even met him a couple times. Once we asked him direct questions about where he was on the day of the murder, which must have alarmed him, because we heard, we heard from him less often after that. Um, a sketchy, and then of course I'm not going to write sketchy in, in my essay as well, but a sketchy um, man is possibly... A sketch, uh, no, no. A man... Uh, interested in the case uh, is possibly a suspect. That's enough to remind me this is. Before I could tell any of this to the ABI investigators, Taylor named our suspect. I told Taylor to give us a few days to organize the information and recordings of phone calls, and then we would turn it over. So Taylor, the Alabama investigator, told Brian Stevenson the name of the person Stevenson had already been talking to about this murder. We want to get Walter out of prison as soon as possible, I insisted. Well, I think the attorney generals and the lawyers would like to maintain the status quo for a few more months until we make an arrest of the actual killer. Right, but you do understand that the status quo is a problem for us. Walter has been on death row for nearly six years for a crime he didn't commit. Taylor and Cole looked at each other uncomfortably. Taylor admitted, If I was in prison for something I didn't do when you were my lawyer, I'd hope you'd get me out as soon as you could. When they left, Bernard and I were very excited, but we remained troubled by this plan to maintain the status quo. I was furious that the straight would try to prolong any order granting relief to Walter. It was consistent with everything that had happened over the last six years, but it was still maddening. We told the court that there was overwhelming evidence that Mr. McMillan's rights had been violated and that he was entitled to immediately relief. Delaying relief would add further injury to a man who had been wrongfully convicted and condemned to death for a crime he did not commit. I was talking to Minnie and the family every week now, keeping everyone updated about the new state investigation. Remember, Minnie is Walter's wife. I feel like something good is about to happen, Brian, Minnie said to me. They've kept him for years. Now it's time they let him go. They have to let him go. I appreciated her optimism, but I was worried too. We've been disappointed so often before. Managing the family's expectations was a complex task. I felt I was supposed to be the oh, was a complex task. I felt I was supposed to be the cautionary voice that prepared family members for the worst, even while I urged them to hope for the best. Increasingly, I was recognizing the importance of hopefulness in creating justice. Um, t 
Taylor and Cole want to maintain the status quo. I think that means everything how it is. It's Latin for something. Um, but maintaining the status quo, not changing everything, anything, which means leaving Walter in jail. Taylor and Cole want to maintain the status quo until they catch the real killer. Brian doesn't like that idea. On February 23rd, nearly, oh, I was going to some coffee. On February 23rd, nearly six weeks after getting the ABI's report, I received a call from the clerk up to the court. I received a, on February 23rd, nearly six weeks after getting the ABI's report, I received a call from the clerk of the court. The court of criminal appeals had ruled in the McMillan case, and we could pick up the opinion. You're going to like this, she said mysteriously. I ran to the courthouse. So, um, six weeks later, the appeals, oh, that's not how you spell appeals, appeals court ruled in the case. I ran to the courthouse. By the time I sat down to read the 35-page ruling, I was out of breath. The clerk was right. The ruling invalidated, so made invalid, Walter's conviction and death sentence. The court did not conclude that he was innocent and must be released, but it ruled in our favor on every other claim and ordered a new trial. Okay, so it invalidated conviction, Walter's conviction and, oh my God, Walter's conviction and sentence. Um, and, and ordered a new trial. Did not call him innocent and order him to be released, right? Okay, so the court's like, whoa, 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 people. Why can't I scroll up on this? Frag doodle things. Anyways, um, all right. I guess if I go like that, then I'll, there we go. Boom, chakalaka. So, so they did not say he's innocent, let him out. Okay, they could have, they didn't. They said, what? This rule, this trial was ridiculous. This is not a valid trial. Go back and do it again. And my computer is being stupid and I want to kill it. I'm scrolling, but it's not scrolling. Shite in your face. Okay. So, what's happening? This is still there. Okay. This, I don't need. And somehow it moved, which makes sense because everything was acting all crazy. Okay. There we go. Okay. God bless America. Okay. I didn't realize how much I feared that we would lose until we finally won. I jumped into the car and raced down to death row. Let's see what's happening here. To tell Walter in person. I watched him take it all in. He leaned back and gave me a familiar chuckle. 
Well, he said slowly, you know, that's good. That's good. Good. It's great. Yeah, it's great. He was grinning now with a freedom I hadn't seen before. Oh, man, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Whew. Six years, six years gone. He looked away with pained expression. These six years feel like 50. Six years gone. I've been so worried they were going to kill me, I haven't even thought about the time they lost. So Walter's reaction. Reaction. Pleased. And then starts thinking about the six years he's lost and the constant fear of death he's been feeling for those six years. Yeah, that works. He's pleased and then he's like, oh God, you know, he's happy and then he starts thinking about <laughs> the injustice of it all. Um, his troubled look sobered me too. I know, Walter. And we're not clear yet, I said. The ruling only gives you a new trial. Given what the ABA has said, I can't believe they would try to prosecute you again. But with this crowd, reasonable conduct is never guaranteed. I'm going to try to get you home as soon as humanly possible. With the thoughts of home, with thoughts of home his mood lightened, and we started talking about things we'd been too afraid to discuss since we'd met. He said, I want to meet everybody who has helped me in Montgomery, and I want to go around with you and tell the world what they did to me. There are other people here who are as innocent as I am. One. Mm. He paused and started smiling again. Man, I want some good food, too. I ain't had no real good food in so long I can't even remember what it tastes like. Whatever you want, it'll be my treat, I said proudly. From what I hear, you might not be able to afford the kind of meal I want, he teased. I want steak, chicken, pork, maybe some good cooked coon. That's raccoon. We relaxed you and laughed a lot. We had laughed before. We had laughed before that. Walter's sense of humor hadn't failed him, despite his six years on death row. But the laughter that day felt very different. It was the laughter of liberation. I drove back to Montgomery and thought about how to speed up Walter's release. I called Tommy Chapman, the DA, remember, and told him that I intended to file a motion to dismiss all charges. Stevenson tells chap and he is going to file a motion to dismiss the charges. Right, a judge can be like, this is ridiculous, we're not even going to do that. And Brian Stevenson tells the DA, I'm going to ask the judge to say, to dismiss all these charges. In light of the appellate court ruling. I asked if he would consider joining the motion, or at least not opposing it. He sighed. I'll get back to you about whether I'll join it. We certainly won't oppose it. Chapman says he won't oppose it. So he won't even fight it, right? Walter would finally be able to walk out of the courthouse a free man. The night before the hearing, I drove down to Minnie's to get a suit for Walter to wear to the courthouse. When I had arrived at her house, she gave me a long hug. It looked like she had been crying and hadn't slept. We sat down and she told me again how happy she was that they were letting him out. But she... Baby! Oh boy, no bark. Come on. No bark. Leave it. Uh, you can't come here. There's a video. Why are you naked? Is dad outside? No. Then you guys should not have been playing with the water. Go get your sister. Mama? Yeah? I only got like 11 kids out there and they got like 20 minutes. Out there? What do you mean? In the I, water? I got, I got like 11 seconds to spray the house and they got like 20 minutes. Yeah, well, they're going to get in trouble. So, who, come here. Don't come too close. Whose idea was turning on the hose? 
really come okay I need to discipline my children hold on one second Brittany poop How old are you? I didn't. How old are you was the question. Who knows what they should and shouldn't do outside more than anyone else. All right. Make sure the hose is off outside. Get in your bed. No books. No toys. You knew better. Period. You know not to play with that water hose. Yes? Did you play with it? Yes. Go make sure it's off and then get in your bed. Can I put clothes on it? No. Go. <sighs> okay, internet. Judge my parenting. It's okay because nobody watches these videos anyway. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Okay. Hi, kids. Welcome back. If I had some editing software, I'd edit that out, but I don't care. All right. So, Stevenson is at Minnie's house. Brian, I think you need to tell him that maybe he shouldn't come back here. This is Minnie talking to Stevenson. So, Walter's wife talking to Stevenson. Brian, I think you need to tell him that maybe he shouldn't come back here. It's just all been too much. The stress, the gossip, the lies everything. He doesn't deserve what they put him through. You need to get dressed in dry clothes. He doesn't deserve what they put him through. And it will hurt me to my heart the rest of my life what they did to him and the rest of us. But I don't think I can go back to the way things were. All right. Um, Minnie... Um, can't go back to the way things were. Wants Stevenson to tell Walter not to come. I'm going to home. Right. And we do have to remember one of the reasons Walter got into this was because he had been connected to Karen Kelly through an affair, right? And then Karen Kelly and Ralph Myers got involved in the Pittman murder. So, like, all of it came out, right? And Minnie knows that Walter was cheating on her and other stuff too. But, you know, she supports him. She supported him, as it said, right? Because there had been a huge injustice, but... She can't go back to the way things were. Well, you all should talk when he gets home, Stevenson says. We want to have everybody over when he gets out. We want to cook some good food, and everybody will want to celebrate. But after that, maybe he should go to Montgomery with you, she said. I had already talked with Walter about not staying his first few nights in Monroeville for security reasons. We had talked about him spending time with family members in Florida while we monitored the local reaction to his release. But I hadn't discussed his future with Minnie. I drove back to Montgomery, sadly realized that even as we stood on the brink of victory and what should have been a glorious release for Walter and his family, this whole nightmare, the conviction, the death sentence, and the heartbreak and devastation of this marriage of, of this miscarriage of justice would likely never be completely over again. So it's a, I don't want to call it a hollow victory, but it's, um, right, it's a victory weighted with the trauma that's going to follow them from all this mistreatment. State, local, and national media outlets were crowded inside the courthouse when I arrived the next morning. Dozens of Walter's family members and friends from the community were there to greet him when he came out. They had made signs and banners, which surprised me. They were such simple gestures, but I found myself deeply moved. The signs gave a silent voice to the crowd. Welcome home, Johnny D. God never fails. Free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. 
I went down to the jail and brought Walter his suit. I told him that a celebration was planned at his house after the hearing. The prison had not allowed Walter to bring his possessions to the courthouse, refusing to acknowledge that he might be released. So we would have to go back to home in prison to get his things before the homecoming meal. I also told him that I'd served that I'd reserved a hotel room for him in Montgomery and that it would probably be safest to spend the next few nights there. I reluctantly talked to him about my conversation with Minnie. He seemed surprised and hurt, but didn't linger on it. This is really a happy, this is a really happy day for me. Nothing can really spoil getting your freedom back. Well, y'all should talk at some point, I urged. I went upstairs to find Tommy Chapman waiting for me in the courtroom. After we're done, I'd like to shake his hand, he told me. Would that be all right? I think he'd appreciate that, I said. This case has taught me things I didn't even know I had to learn, Chapman said. We've all learned a lot, Tommy. Everyone was strangely pleasant. Judge Norton had retired weeks before the ruling, and the new judge, Pamela Bachab, greeted me warmly. Mr. Stevenson, I don't need any arguments or statements. I intend to grant the motion immediately so y'all can get home. We can get this done quickly, she said. There was no metal detector, no menacing dog. The courtroom was packed with Walter's members and supporters. There were more cheering black folks outside the courthouse who couldn't get in. A horde of television cameras and journalists spilled out of the crowded courtroom. They finally brought Walter into the courtroom, wearing a black suit and a white shirt I brought him. The deputies didn't handcuff Walter or shackle him, so he walked in waving to family and friends. Many in the crowd gasped. His family had not seen him dressed in anything but his white prison uniform in six years. He looked handsome and fit, like a different man. The judge took the bench and I stepped forward to speak. I gave a brief history of the case and informed the court that both the defendant and the state were moving the court to, no to dismiss all the charges. The judge, the judge quickly granted the motion and asked if there was anything further. Everyone was suddenly generous and accommodating. It was as if they wanted to be sure there were no hard feelings or grudges. I felt strangely agitated. We were about to leave court for the last time and I started thinking about how much pain and suffering had been inflicted on Walter, his family, the entire community. I thought about how if Judge Robert E. Lee Key Jr. hadn't overwritten the jury's verdict of life imprisonment without parole and imposed the death penalty, which is what brought our case, which is what brought the case to our attention, Walter likely wouldn't have spent the rest of his life incarcerated and died in a prison cell. I thought about how certain it was that hundreds, maybe thousands of other people were just as innocent as Walter, but would never get the help they need. I knew this wasn't the time to make a speech, but I couldn't stop myself from making one final comment. Your Honor, I spoke up. I just want to say this before we adjourn. It was far too easy to convict this wrongly accused man for murder and send him to death row for something he didn't do, and much too hard to win his freedom after proving his innocence. We have serious problems and important work that must be done in this state. I sat down and the judge pronounced Walter free to go. Just like that, he was a free man. Walter hugged me tightly and I gave him a handkerchief to wipe the tears from his eyes. Graciously, Walter agreed to shake Chapman's hand. I asked Bernard to tell the family and supporters that we would meet them out front. Hey, I will send you to your beds. I am trying to work. You are not supposed to be trading Pokemon cards. Do you hear me? Walter stood very close to me as we answered questions from the press. I could tell he was feeling overwhelmed, so I cut off the questions after a few minutes. TV camera crews followed us as we exited the courthouse. Outside, dozens of people cheered and waved their signs. 
Walter's relatives ran up to hug him, and they hugged me too. Walter's grandchildren grabbed his hands. Walter couldn't believe how many people were there for him. Even when some of the men came up to shake his hand, he gave them a hug. I told everyone that Bernard and I had to take Walter to the prison to pick up his things, and that we would come to the house directly from there. On the drive to the prison, Walter told me that the men on death row had held a special service for him on his last night. They had come to pray for him and give him their final hugs. Walter said he felt guilty leaving them behind. I told him not to. They were all thrilled to know he was going home. His freedom was, in a small way, a sign of hope in a hopeless place. We went to the prison to collect. We went to the prison office to collect Walter's possessions, his legal materials and correspondence with me, letters from family and supporters, a Bible, the Timex watch he was wearing when they when he was arrested, and the wallet he had had with him back in June of 1987 when his nightmare began. The wallet still had twenty-three dollars in it. Walter had given to other death row prisoners his fan, a dictionary, and the food items he had in his cell. A few guards watched as we walked out the front gate of the prison. Members of the press and people from Walter's family and community had followed our car to the prison. Lots of people were gathered outside. I saw Mrs. Williams. Walter went up to her and gave her a hug. She looked over and winked at me. I couldn't help but laugh. Men in their cells could see the crowd outside. Men in their cells could see the crowd outside and started shouting encouragement to Walter as we walked away. We couldn't see them from outside the prison, but their voices rang out just the same. The voices were haunting because they were disembodied, but they were full of excitement and hopefulness. One of the last voices we heard was a man shouting. Stay strong, man. Stay strong. Walter shouted back. All right. As we walked to the car, Walter raised his arms and gently moved them up and down as if he meant to take flight. He looked uh, at me and said, I feel like a bird. I feel like a bird. Okay, well, I don't think I cried when I read that the first time. Maybe I did. All right. So uh, I got kind of caught up in it and I didn't take notes for a while. Uh, so um, the last thing I wrote was Minnie couldn't go back to the way things were. Okay. Um, uh, at Walter's hearing the... Judge dismisses the case. Stevenson uh, dismisses the case and Walter is free to go. Stevenson says it was too easy to convict too wrongfully. Convict him and too hard to get an innocent man out of jail. Um, Walter feels a little guilty for leaving the other death row inmates. Yeah. Um, when they go to pick up his stuff, there is huge support from the prison population. Walter 
fields free as a word. Okay. So, yeah, so there's a hearing. And make sure we understand this. The Alabama Supreme Court did not say Walter was innocent, right? They're like, they said that the trial was invalid, it was messed up, it didn't work right, and so they ordered it to go back and to do a new trial. And so um, it overturns that conviction, and then it all goes back to the DA, Tom Chapman, and to the judge, and, you know, they have to decide, are they going to try this man? If he's guilty, if he's clearly guilty, then, yeah, they're going to go try it. Or if they're still holding, you know, some, often there will be a new trial. In this case, it became so clear that he was innocent that the judge, Brian Stevenson, asked the judge to simply dismiss the charges. And the judge did without fight from the DA Chapman or anyone else, which meant that he was free to go. He wasn't even charged with murder. Um, he went and picked up his stuff. And that's the end of the chapter. So I'm going to go discipline my children and stuff. We have all of our notes. It's about a page and a half of, you know, um, sentence fragments that uh, we can now take, open up a new document, and turn this into a couple of paragraphs of summary of chapter uh, 11 of Just Mercy. Uh, I'll see you guys on the flip side when we do chapter 12. Take care. Bye.